Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Francisco Community Roundtable meeting. I would like to call this meeting to order the April 6, 2022 SFO Airport Community Roundtable at 7 p.m. We are meeting via Zoom. Joining us today are staff to the roundtable, Doreen Stockdale, Interim Roundtable Coordinator, Angela Montes, Roundtable Administrative Secretary, Jeanette Lejean, Executive Secretary, San Mateo County Planning Department, Jean Rindale, Aviation Technical Consultant for HMMH. We also have Lisa Awasasa, Deputy Director, Planning and Building Department, County of San Mateo, Linda Wallen, Senior Legislative Aide to Supervisor Pine, Bert Ganong, San Francisco International Airport Noise Abatement Manager, Brian Perkins from the Office of Congresswoman Jackie Spear, and I see Alana Jarris from the FAA. Doreen, did I miss anyone? No, that's everyone. Okay, very good. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Montes. She will advise the public how they may participate during public comment. Thank you, Chairman Hindi. For those attending the meeting on the Zoom video conference, we will use the raise hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the general public comment periods, I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raise hand feature to speak on that agenda item. You will have two minutes. For those joining by phone, please press star nine to indicate your desire to speak and then star six to unmute when called upon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montes. Now we will move on to roll call. Ms. Stockdale, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. City and County of San Francisco Board of Supervisors? No answer. City and County of San Francisco Mayor's Office? No answer. City and County of San Francisco Airport Commission? Here, Doug Yackel. Thank you. San Mateo County Board of Supervisors? Dave Pine. Thank you. SeaCag uh, Airport Land Use Commission. Is that me, Carol Ford? Yes, thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. Town of Atherton? Yes, Bill Widmer. Thank you. City of Belmont? No answer. City of Brisbane? No answer. City of Burlingame? Ricardo Ortiz. Thank you. Town of Colma? John Goodwin. Thank you. City of Daly City? Pamela Di Giovanni. Thank you. City of Foster City? Pam Hindi. Thank you. City of Half Moon Bay? No answer. Town of Hillsboro? Present, Al Royce. Thank you. City of Menlo Park? Cecilia Taylor, present. Thank you. City of Millbrae? Ann Schneider, present. Thank you. City of Pacifica. No answer. Town of Portola Valley. No answer. City of Redwood City. Good evening, Jeff G. Thank you. City of San Bruno. Tom Hamilton here. Thank you. City of San Carlos. No answer. City of San Mateo? No answer. City of South San Francisco? No answer. Town of Woodside? John Carvel, present. Perfect, thank you. You have quorum. Hey, thank you, Ms. Stockdale. Next on our agenda is public comment. And this segment of the meeting is for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. If any members of the public would like to comment on item on the agenda, please wait till that item is brought for discussion. With that, our staff will read any written comments and allow members of the public to speak. Thank, thank you, Chairman. And I do see one hand raised by um, Darlene Yapley. So Ms. Yapley, please accept this request from your microphone and begin speaking. Topic one, potential safety violations. The temporary noise monitoring by San Francisco, page 16 of their noise report, revealed some interesting results. 
Over a two week period, about 17% of SFO arrivals flew below, below 4,000 feet over some parts of Palo Alto. The new Class B airspace sector over many parts of Palo Alto has a 4,000 foot floor, so no flying below 4,000 feet. Flying below the floor means the exit, exiting Class B airspace and represents a potential safety violation. About 17% is a routine occurrence, not a rare one. If safety is the number one priority, there should not be commercial jets flying below 4,000 feet over densely populated areas. Some of these overfly San Jose traffic at 3,000 feet or below and some general aviation from Palo Alto Airport and San Carlos Airport. FAA, these potential safety violations must be investigated mm -hmm. soon as there could be implications for Palo Alto and nearby cities. Topic two, membership on roundtable subcommittees. At the February meeting, it was communicated that the subcommittees are moving to three voting members each. After looking at the subcommittee summary in the meeting minutes, it appears there are no South Peninsula members on any subcommittee. Ground-based noise, legislative TWG work plan. I believe this was unintentional. The process used for subcommittee membership selection was the order of who volunteered first during the meeting. This process did not yield a balanced representation of North, Central, and South Peninsula, like you did thoughtfully for the membership committee. In the spirit of inclusivity and balanced representation, Chair Hindi, please consider using your discretion to add or substitute a member on a subcommittee so that at least one South Peninsula member has representation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yapley. And with that, Chairman, we do not have any more hands raised for items not on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Ms. Montel and Ms. Yapley. Thank you for your comments. Uh, with that now, I would like to consider setting the agenda and taking an action on the consent agenda items. Staff will note any written comments and allow members of the public to speak. Ms. Montez, do we have any public comments on item 1-3, 1-2-3? Thank you, Chairman. I do not see any virtual hands raised for this item, but if we want to give it just a second or two, um, if hands queue up, but I do not see any hands from the public. Thank you, Ms. Montez. Yes, we'll give it a few seconds here. This is uh, on the consent agenda, if any member of the public would like to speak an item on that. Uh, while we're waiting, I have not received any request from any of the members to pull an item on the consent. If any member would like to pull an item on the consent calendar, now would be the time to do so. And I do see member Schneider's hands raised. Member Schneider, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to pull anything, and I'm happy to vote yes for everything on consent calendar except approval of the director's report. Uh, I have to vote no on the director's report because it does not reflect the type of noise that impacts my residents. Noted. Thank you. Okay. With that, I would entertain a motion to set the agenda and approve the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move we set the agenda as listed and we approve the consent items one, two, and three. I second it. Thank you, Vice Chair Royce and Member Widmer for the motion and the second. Ms. Stockdale? Yes. City and County of San Francisco Airport Commission. Yes. San Mateo County Board of Supervisors? Yes. Thank you. CCAG Airport Land Use Commission. Carol, you might be muted. Here. Ms. Ford. Okay, we'll come back to her. Town of Atherton? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. That's okay. Yes, um, I vote yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. City of Burlingame? Yes. Thank you. Town of Coma? Yes. Thank you. City of Daly City? Yes. Thank you. City of Foster City? Yes. Thank you. Town of Hillsborough? Yes. Thank you. City of Menlo Park? Yes. Thank you. We have Milbray. Uh, no on one with my comments to be added to the minutes and yes on the rest. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
City of Redwood City? Yes. Thank you. City of San Bruno? Yes. Thank you. City, oh, sorry, Town of Woodside? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Stockdale. Uh, next on our agenda is item number four, the ground-based augmentation system GBAS report. With us, Jean Rindale is going to be giving us a brief presentation on the information that was presented at the last two technical working group meetings. Mr. Rindale. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry for the delay there in getting the presentation up, but um, at your request, um, I am presenting an overall summary of the uh, proposed GLS innovative approach procedures as recommended um, for implementation by SFO or San Francisco International Airport. And this is a um, review of what was um, presented and discussed at um, a couple of the technical working group meetings. Uh, going over today, there are actually nine uh, GLS innovative approach procedures that the airport is um, recommending at this time and that we were asked by the roundtable to review. Um, the airport is actually recommending more than these nine, but these nine were the ones that the roundtable had asked, requested that um, HMH review. And then we also um, recently reviewed the uh, noise measurement results related to um, some GLS procedures that were actually flown. And then I'll go over uh, the conclusions of our reviews and then a summary. And I do wanna make it clear that this presentation um, is a review summary from HMH, but that we did not do this work. We simply reviewed the um, information provided to us and to the round table by the airport. And it was their analysis, data and noise measurement report that we reviewed. So the nine proposed GLS innovative approach procedure at SFO, they were um, uh, as represented there, um, we opted to not go into the details of each of these. They are on the website. Um, the uh, San Francisco has put them all available to people to review. And uh, just wanted to be clear on the ones that we did look at. Um, group A was the D-Bay runway um, 28 right. One of the procedures there, there were four procedures for the bridge visual and tiptoe visual, which is part of group B. Group C had two GLSR and procedures, approach procedures, and then group E had two GLSA, um, which are runway 10 left and right. And I will explain that one in a little bit as part of a um, overall summary at the end. Um, but, so the purpose of our review was to affirm or not affirm, but um, the airport's assertion regarding changes to noise as expected, or they predicted through their modeling efforts and analysis, um, and going to these new procedures over the existing procedures. And then identify potential procedure changes that could provide further noise reductions. And we did those in a few times, but um, in a few cases, however, um, those aren't um, being modified at this time as a result of any recommendations we made, but I do believe that they are looking into some of those recommendations if they wanted to uh, modify them in the future. And so what I want to be clear is that while we did provide some um, suggestions for improvements, those are not, um, if you go ahead and suggest that they go and implement the procedures, those changes would not be part of those implementations. And then um, also to advise the roundtable on procedure acceptance, which I will summarize at the end of the presentation. So a little bit about our methodology. Um, we conducted a basic review using um, the documentation from the airport's website. We also used um, satellite imagery and estimated population center information that was available to us. Uh, we looked at the sectional charts and instrument procedure charts that were um, uh, of 
of issue or of importance um, with these procedures and a little bit of additional documentation um, from the airport. Uh, knowing that noise may shift when flight paths move laterally, um, so we reviewed lateral assessment, or our review included assessments of potential lateral shifts as proposed in the procedures. We did not conduct a rigorous technical review nor analysis of our own. We used the analysis from the airport um, and uh, made our uh, conclusions based on the analysis they did. We didn't do any independent analysis. It was mainly a review, which is focused on the possible change of single event noise levels from aircraft on the proposed procedures as compared to the existing procedures. And as you see there on the right, um, just kind of some rules of thumb, if you will, on um, relative changes to single event noise levels with less than one dB on a single event basis not being perceptible. Whereas if a change of one to three dB were to occur, that would be barely noticeable. Whereas a three to five decibel change is noticeable. And anything greater than five dB is very noticeable and starts to become or perceived as being twice as loud or half as loud. And so wanted to be clear in our analysis or our review of San Francisco's analysis that we actually consider changes of less than one dB as uh, no perceptible change. So that led us to some of the conclusions that we made um, on these procedures. In addition to the review of the procedures themselves and the modeling that they did for the procedures, they being San Francisco International Airport, um, they also, the SFO conducted um, test flights uh, between December 2nd and December 16th um, to fly um, some of these proposed procedures to see if the noise levels that they would measure may would kind of make sense or you know in the right direction what were the noise levels what could we expect from maybe these changes in, in procedures in terms of noise um, and how does that compare to how they model um, the expected changes so you can see um, that they actually flew 13 test flights. Um, I'll say right away that um, one of them uh, was considered um, not successful in, in that it was the GLS-A approach, and, uh, but all the others um, successful. And so there were four RNAV approaches, four GLS approaches. One of those were the one unsuccessful ones, and then five non-GLS approaches. Um, and that's not included in the table to the right. And the table to the right does show in the, um, the, each of the procedures when they were flown. You can see four of them were in on December 2nd in the evening. And then the others were on December 16th in the morning. And, and uh, you can see there for yourselves whether their flaps were deployed. And if so, to what um, percentage or what level whether speed brakes were deployed. And these are all over site E, by the way, and you can see the measurement locations. I forgot to say that earlier. Um, so if you're looking down from Eddy to Sydney, um, you can see that the noise measurements go from A, B, C, D, E, and then F. And so A is the furthest out from the airport and in chronological in alphabetical order then F being closest to the airport. And so it was over site E that they looked at flaps, speed brakes, whether they were deployed or stowed, and then landing gear, whether they were up or down. And so you can see the results uh, of, their, of that in that table. So now, uh, what was the, real, the purpose um, of the uh, test flights? Um, it was uh, the report describes the noise and flight evaluation methodology criteria and results. But the report shows a comparison of the measured noise levels produced by non-GLS approaches to those produced by GLS innovative approaches. And also what's not written here, but it was also part of the report was how it compared to what they modeled or what they were expecting of those uh, procedures. So the conclusions from the noise measurements of procedures, um, United Airlines completed um, a number of successful approaches. I do need to make a correction here 
Sorry, I wasn't able to do it before the packet went out, so I'll just do it uh, verbally, and then we can decide whether to change the information that's in the packet. But United Airlines um, did not fly all of those procedures because the non-GLS um, approaches were actually flown by United Airlines did one, American Airlines did one, but then Southwest Airlines did three. And so then United Airlines did the four RNAV approaches and the three GLS approaches um, for San Francisco. Um, and so the non-GLS approaches were those that were determined um, to be a, the standard approach flown by the same aircraft type as the RNAV and GLS approaches. So the uh, based on the measurements, and these are averages now, and so um, I will say up front that not all the um, uh, RNAV and GLS approaches were necessarily quieter than the existing ones, but on average, the RNAV approaches were about one to five dB quieter, and the GLS approaches, based on these measurements, were about four to seven decibel quieter on average. So these, um, there just isn't enough, um, you know, having these 12 flights to compare, uh, you don't have a statistically valid sample. But it was uh, really those measurements at the measurement sites A through F there. Um, as you can see in the upper right, um, they were done just to get an idea. Are they in the ballpark of what they were predicting? Um, that sort of thing. And, and the report clearly shows that, you know, the flights were within the ballpark. Some were quieter, some were louder. But on average, you see that it was kind of in the right, right direction of being quieter than existing procedures. So Gene, Gene, is that true for all E and F sites, measurement sites? Yes, or on was average. It, or was it on average across all the sites? It was on average across each of the sites. You had some that were louder, some that were quieter, but those averages, and I'll go back to the previous slide, on average, that's why you have the difference of one to five dB. That's across those you no, know, I, 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 I appreciate so it. So maybe, it, and I don't remember which one, but it might have been only one dB at site A and five dB at site F. I don't remember which one correlates to which one, but that's why that's the range there, because at each of those independent sites, we either got one to five dB quieter on our nav approaches and four to seven dB quieter on GLS approaches at the individual sites. Mr. Rindale, may I pause you for a second, please? Please. If any member has any questions, please go through the chair and do not just interject the presenter. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. So in summary, uh, based on our review of the uh, modeling that was done on the um, GLS approach procedures compared to existing procedures, uh, there's we saw nothing in the information that would say any of their analysis was not well or not um, as they reported and the expected changes to noise um, is as you know no reason to believe it's not what they expect um, we suggest actually that the roundtable support the airport's Im implementation of those nine procedures that we reviewed um, and the reason one of the reasons for that is actually that you know the airport this is different than implementation of metroplex the airport has said that um, if they go ahead and implement these procedures, they can, you know, if something doesn't work as they expected or things come up to light that they were not expecting, they could they can pull these um, relatively quickly and it would revert back to what's being flown today. And that is different than what's, you know, with the FAA's changes to the Metroplex. So, and I also want to note, you see the note down there at the bottom that, um, only Group E, those um, procedures onto runways 10 left and right, um, result in a noticeable change in single event noise levels. However, the airport expects the use of the procedures to reduce missed approaches, which increases safety and reduces cumulative noise. And those procedures are used so rarely, they, um, you know, it's, it's rare that aircraft arrive either 10 left or 10 right. Yeah, it it's only in uh, very uh, rare weather conditions. And I believe that is um, the end of the summary. Um, and so I am available to answer some questions. I know the San Francisco airport has their consultants and staff available 
and also there's people here, the members of the technical working group that um, were involved in, you know, reviewing our work as well. They're available to answer questions if there are any, and I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. J. Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, thank you, Mr. Rindell, for your presentation. And um, before I open this floor for discussion, I would like to ask SFO who will be speaking on this item on their from their from their side. This is Chair Bert and I, uh, San Francisco Noise Office. We have uh, Paul Hanna and Christian Valdez available for question. Thank you, Mr. Gunnar. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open it for the members for <laughs> questions and discussion. I see member Taylor has her, her hand up. Member Taylor, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Handy. I just wanted to follow up on an earlier question um, to find out from, not sure, it's not Mr. Rendell, um, who um, with HMMH or the SFO can answer this. And that is just where is the exact information per site for sites A through F, as opposed to an average? That is contained in the report that um, San Francisco has provided to the roundtables and it's in your packet. Um, my review was intended to just be a high level overview of what was in that, but the details are all contained in that report, which you have been provided a copy. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And Chair Hendy, I, I'll um, reserve my, my time to come back um, and follow up after I look at the report again. Thank you. Absolutely, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I see Vice Chair Royce, hand is up, Vice Chair. Uh, yes, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a couple of questions for cl clarification, Gene. You said the average was quiet error from different variations. Were any of the tests individually louder? Yes, the there were. There were tests that were louder. That's what I wanted to say, that those were on average, they were quieter, but there were um, tests that were actually um, slightly um, you know, up to seven dB, if I remember right, and that's off the top of my head, but it, it did, uh, some were actually louder. Some of the test flights were louder um, than, than the non-GLS flights. And just remember that, um, you know, all the modeling that is done is really based on averages of how aircraft will fly on average. It's not to say that every single aircraft would fly exactly that on average every time. And so that's why I'm saying that we also don't have a statistically valid sample, but the data does show that it's essentially in the right direction and that there's no reason for alarm here, in my opinion, that all the, you know, their measurements didn't show that everything was louder and, you know, maybe we need to go take another look at this because it, it, that wasn't the case. Again, it was on average quieter, but yes, there were events that at some of the sites that were that were higher than the non-GLS approaches. When you say higher, Gene, uh, I, I understood you say seven, so that'd be noticeably higher. Yes, there were some that were noticeably higher as well as there were some that were noticeably quieter. And so on average, they tended to be quieter. Okay. And then secondly, just to confirm with respect to the the uh, tests that were done, I'm assuming the weather and the altitude and all the rest was equivalent to that using the modeling. There's no differentials there? No, there are some differences in the weather. Um, again, the model assumes an annual average weather condition. And again, it's all about averages with the models. And so that's one thing to, to keep in mind too, is that I think during some of the ones that were uh, louder, there was a really low ceiling and uh, could have even been a temperature inversion that wasn't determined exactly or whatever, but they did note that, um, I think it was the December 16th flights, if I remember right, those were during a really low ceiling morning, which you know happens there. So yes, the weather certainly, um, it was not as modeled because they modeled an, an, an annual average rather than a, a typical a, a, a distinct morning. And Gene, just one last question there, and I might be getting ahead of myself, but I understand that Palo Alto did their did a study, hired a consulting group that did a study. Their results were a little bit different than the results that the SFO airport did. Had you looked at that study and is there any reconciliation between the two? Well, that study, and that's why I pointed out earlier that not everything was quieter. 
right? And that's what they looked at. And I, I don't know that there's a, a big disconnect between their results and what the San Francisco airport showed. Um, again, there, there are, there were events that were higher. I think, I think they were in agreement with what I said that we don't have a statistically sound sample. You really, and I mentioned this in the technical working group and I'll mention it again here, you really need months worth of data to really understand, you know, on, on a noise basis, if it's, if it's indeed quieter or, or, or noisier or about the same. And we just can't run that kind of a test or San Francisco would not be able to run that kind of a test without implementing them. So, okay, thanks, Gene. I, I have some comments, but I'll save them for later. I just had some questions right now. Thank sure. you. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Next, I have Member Woodmer. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, Gene, uh, I remember from the, the technical working group discussions, um, you know, this came up, and I just want to verify uh, there was these flights that United ran were didn't have passengers on and were lightly loaded. Is that not correct? I don't know about the total loading because fuel takes, um, you, you know, is a part of the loading <laughs> as well. And maybe San Francisco has a better idea. Maybe they understood from United. But yes, they were not revenue generating flights, which means there were no passengers on board. So, and, and, and so um, even though a few of them then had to use their air brakes because they had to use it to reduce speed, with the heavier uh, flights and the larger aircraft coming in at the same approach with the same technique, um, is it conceivable to think that they would have to use their air brakes perhaps more is, and generate more noise? at that point in time as they're slowing down to make the turn? Is that a true assumption or is it not? Um, I am not equipped to be able to answer that specifically. Um, I, I know that weight is obviously a factor. Weight is more of a factor on departure than on arrival, but I can't say how the weight would have affected the deployment of speed brakes or even flaps for that matter. I'm sure weight played some role in that, but I don't know to what extent that would be. And I don't know if San Francisco or their consultants have, are able to answer that question. Looks like Paul Hanna might be able to answer. Yeah, let me invite the uh, representative from SFO to feel free to jump in and answer questions from the member that you would think you're more equipped to answer instead of Gene. Thanks, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity here. J just very quickly, so I, I can answer maybe both questions. The first question about the weight of the aircraft, um, your recollection is correct. Um, United operated the aircraft with no passengers. That was a, a requirement for the safety of the evaluation flights. Um, the resulting weight of the aircraft was, um, it was on the lighter side, but not necessarily outside of the realm of a normal weight for an aircraft arriving into San Francisco. So um, we, we think about them kind of more on the, on the lighter side. Um, so maybe representative of 25 to 30% of the typical arrivals coming into SFO, but certainly not 100%. I think with respect to your question about um, uh, air brake usage or speed brake usage and flap deployment, um, it's very dependent actually on um, the energy state of the aircraft um, as they transition from the arrival into the approach. And, and what I mean by that is um, sometimes a heavier aircraft that has already fully configured um, because it's heavy and the nature of, of lift is that the lift has to count on the weight. And, and so making that much lift actually creates quite a bit of drag. Um, and so sometimes a heavier aircraft is already relatively slow and they don't wind up needing to do a lot of late kind of configuration changes. And so one of the interesting things about this aircraft that, that United very kindly made available to us is it's one of the cleaner airplanes. Um, and it, it actually has some interesting characteristics where when it is a little bit light, um, they have more challenges uh, with energy management. So I, we felt it was a very interesting uh, set of samples in that respect, but I'm not sure how many, how many additional flights in the future would have exactly the same problems um, or, or speed brake usage? So sorry, that's not maybe the best answer, but uh, I hope it makes sense. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. So while we got Mr. Hanna here, anybody has any questions either for HMMH? Okay, Mr. Uh, Member G, I see his hand up. Thank you, Chair Hindi. I, I was curious, and I think, Gene, you may have answered this question, <clears throat> but I missed it. 
you know, I think it's great to have some test flights, but how many flights, I think you suggested a year's worth of, of records, but how many flights would it take to, to get a better feel that this is going to really make a difference? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say because you don't know the scatter that you're going to get in the data, right? So it's all about, you know, getting enough flights to where you can make sense of statistically of that scatter. And clearly we had, you know, between probably seven on the high side to 12 on the low side, something like that. So we had a scatter already of about over 15 decibels, right? And so trying to get enough flights, I... I originally said and i said earlier months of data i don't know how many months of data it would take um but it, it's certainly more than you know they did a they did like 12 flights um it's certainly more than probably it's not going to be 20 or 50 or even 100 it's going to take a lot of a lot of data to really realize it and also you don't want to base it all on a single aircraft size and type you would want multiple aircraft to fly and really see you know, like the GBAS um, analysis San Francisco did, it included multiple aircraft types and, um, and that does matter. So again, they United was gracious enough and it's quite an expensive endeavor actually to do these test flights with non-revenue flights. So it was, you know, thank, we should be thanking United for even allowing that to happen, but really to get the data we're, we're in, in need of is it's going to be months if i didn't say a year but it could be a year we don't know until we start seeing the spread in the data um you just sort of created two new questions for me so you know as oh, someone oh. Who, who doesn't <laughs> fly a, a 737 you know max what does what does expensive mean to do a test flight is it ten dollars or ten thousand dollars per flight? I, I just don't know, so I'm sorry. It, it, it's certainly in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars per flight. Thank you. So then that begs the question of if if the roundtable were to support moving forward with some of these innovative approaches, how do we then what's what's the reporting mechanism going forward to know that these are really making a difference? that you suggest that it might take months of data uh, and maybe that you know, this is not for you, Jim, but for the team, you know, are we going to get reports at every roundtable meeting to know that this is working, not working, hitting glitches? What, what does that next step mechanism look like? I don't know if you're looking to me necessarily. I haven't, you know, I'm not part of the- No, no I know that, Gina. It's probably more for SFO, the SFO team or <clears throat> somebody else. But how will we know if we were, say, to support these innovative approaches, will we get those months of data to review to see if it really is going in the right direction or we just, how, what, what, what does that look like? And it's okay to say we don't know yet and that we have to develop it, <clears throat> but my expectations would be that if the roundtable were to support this and they were to be implemented, that, that we would get data to see if it is holding true. Am I making too much stuff up, Bert? Council Member G. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we are definitely looking at what we'll need to do going forward. And as far as the ask that we have on the table tonight, it'll be a while uh, with putting them in the uh, gateway, for the FAA's approvals. In the meantime, we'll be looking at the handful that we have in place right now and that are being flown. So with those, we'll be able to work on the information that we have, but they won't be the same ones that we tested, nor will we be the ones that we put into the uh, process for the approvals going forward. No, Bert, I, I appreciate it. I think it's important that if the roundtable were to support the innovative approaches, as Gene has suggested the roundtable consider, that there is a follow-up mechanism so that we know based on the data, based on months of, you know, actual data that it is still holding true or if it's not working and so that, that that's a, that should be part of the program we totally understand that and we 
as you know, we're definitely forthcoming with information and we'll be providing. And then, Bert, oh, you, real quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's okay. And, and then I was just curious, you know, we always talk about our frustrations about how long this takes. Can the team kind of help me understand how long it's taken to get to this point? How much effort in terms of dollars or number of parties or number of agencies? I mean, just to, just to help manage our expectations, as you suggest, this doesn't happen overnight, but it'd take five months to get to this point, five years, 50 years, and you know, $20 million, just kind of an order of magnitude. I'm not looking for details. And, and so just, you know, it, these things don't happen overnight. They take a lot of effort. So I was just curious. Yeah, I think in addition to that, because this is along the lines of what I was going to ask as well, Bert, is that, you know, if you got approval tonight, really realistically, also how much longer until they would be implemented and we, we would be starting to get the data to even evaluate. So add that to the responses that you would provide to member Jean's request. Definitely will. Anything else, member G? No, I was just looking for some answers, Chair Hendy, and hopefully uh, someone it. can answer. <laughs> Thank you, Chair yeah. Hendy. Thank you. I see Mr. Yackel's hand is up, yeah. and perhaps he does some answers for us. Thank you, Chair Hindi and Jeff. Uh, great questions. Uh, and, and certainly for us, having some mechanism to really validate that um, what we think we're achieving is actually being achieved is critical in this process. So um, yes, we are going to be setting up methods and methodology to ensure that what has been designed to do good is actually doing good. In terms of um, kind of what's what the timeline has been and who's been involved. This is about six years of work um, that we've been on. Our first test flight was back in 2016. Uh, so it's taken us that long to uh, get to the point that we're at right now. Uh, we know that from the time that we implement or submit proposed procedures into the FAA for evaluation, that begins another clock of anywhere from 18 to 30 months. So in other words, a year and a half to perhaps two and a half years uh, before a procedure comes out the other end with an approval, uh, hopefully from the FAA. So this is definitely a long game that we're in. Uh, we've invested millions of dollars already into this process. Uh, Paul Hanna can probably speak more to the level of engagement, but uh, we've had representation and very, um, committed representation from the pilot community of all of the major U.S. airlines. We've had very deep uh, FAA involvement, uh, but probably most importantly is the, is the interactions that we're having right here. So it really does take a village and, uh, and it's been a long time coming. Doug, thank you for that. I, I know it takes a village and I just want to thank all the partners and everybody that's involved because it is it does take a lot of people and a lot of partners. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Hendy. Uh, thank you, Mr. G. Very, very, very uh, well thought out uh, questions, which really segues to my comments and to my few questions. I don't see any other members have their hands up. If anyone has a question, I'll yield the time for them to speak. Otherwise, I'll go ahead with my comments. Okay, seeing none. So, I mean, for me, the biggest observation, obviously, oh, I see Member Taylor, please go ahead. Chair Handy, I'm comfortable waiting for you. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, for me, obviously, and I think Jean has alluded to it, and uh, that the test flights are not statistically valid scientifically just because of the sample of it. But it, it should not be, um, we should really be aware that it's going to take flights to have a scientific database for SFO to present to us. So um, that definitely need to happen. Uh, but my biggest concern and my question that I had asked on the technical working group was, what would it take to deactivate a procedure? How long would it take? What is the process if a procedure, because we got commitment from SFO and from director uh, Satero himself numerous times that if a procedure creates more noise, they will deactivate it. And I believe that will happen. But my only question is, 
what's the process? Does the FAA need to approve it? I know it is a private procedure that is not controlled by the FAA. SFO could decide, and correct me if I'm wrong, F SFO could decide they want to deactivate it, but they still have to go to the FAA with that request or that submittal, if you will. Uh, so the question is, let's say we get a procedure that we find out it's really creating noise to communities uh, that it's flying over. Can someone help me understand and help everybody understand what would it take and time-wise and what's the process? Chairperson Hindi, if it's okay, I'll, I'll take that one if that's all right. Um, so I can speak to the technical process of, of how quickly, relatively speaking, you know, we, we're talking about a project that has started uh, here at SFO in 16 and we're still maybe 18 months away from getting innovative uh, potential procedures, you know, developed. So um, when I say quickly, it's far faster than, than that timeline. Um, our interactions with the FAA on this particular question, um, because this is a, um, the GBAS is a non-federal nav aid, which is just a classification, which means that the airport owns the nav aid and the airport um, operates and maintains the nav aid in accordance with the FAA non-federal nav aid program. Um, so because, because FA, San Francisco has that ownership over the lab aid, and because each procedure that, um, that we're discussing with, with uh, members of the community here um, has to be loaded into that nav aid, which means that the, the airport owns it. If the airport or members of the community, you know, uh, in, in the not too distant future, discover that there's something wrong with the procedure that needs to be deactivated, um, the process to deactiv deactivate the approach um, can be done very quickly. Um, in some cases, hours. Uh, if there, so for instance, if there was a safety problem with one of the uh, approach procedures, which is always a, uh, always a possibility, as many of you have heard about from the 5G uh, issues that, that affected aviation uh, just a few months ago. Um, if there's a safety problem, it's a NOTAM, which is uh, issued by the airport or the FAA, and it's instantly um, effectively uh, turned off. Now, there is a process that um, the airport has to notify the FAA that that is the step that's being taken. That's also being done for safety reasons, not for getting FAA concurrence, so to speak, to deactivate an approach procedure. Um, so, so it's not necessarily a long drawn out process. If we get to that point where there's a procedure that maybe has a noise challenge um, that's been identified through, through, um, through rigor or, or, or processes that are to be identified, then um, it's, it's a process of the airport goes in, we, we find the approach that's the problem, we deactivate it, we, we have to tell the FAA. So there's a, there's, you know, a couple of minutes to hours in there, but you're talking about something total time of maybe 24 hours at the most. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the process that we understand that the airport has the authority to do for these innovative procedures and the overlay procedures right now. So I hope that answers your question. It, it does. That's kind of reassuring for me knowing that because our understanding and our experience has been if it's an FAA procedure, which is this is not, it would be a very lengthy uh, process, which takes years for anything to change and happens after it has been approved by the FAA. Um, now, Mr. Hanna, notwithstanding the safety, I just want to be clear. Uh, obviously, safety will be almost instant. instant. <laughs> but if it's non-safety issue, we're still talking about 24 hours to 48 hours. Yeah, so I, I think oh, I see Alana's got her hand up as well. So I don't know if, if she wanted to contribute more to this, but I, I think the, the, the timeline that, that, that I'm alluding to at this point is the timeline that it takes to for the airport and, you know, the operator of, of the nav aid with these procedures loaded into it to be effective in communicating across the FAA lines to let them know that this is this is what's happening, because we also have to communicate the reason, um, which really just kind of tells the FAA how long this thing is going to be out, because there's a difference between uh, a procedure that has a problem that we're going to try to fix, you know, uh, and we might be able to get it back up really quickly versus there's a fundamental problem with this procedure. Everybody stand by. It could be, it could be a while before it comes back up. I'm sorry, Alana, if you wanted to jump in on that. No, you're fine. Paul pretty much covered it. it. It really depends on the reason. So there's not like a given timeline for safety reasons. It can be a number of hours. And then um, if it's not safety related, it can be a matter of days. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Jarvis, and thank you, Mr. Hanna, for the response. Um, 
so I, let me just go ahead and echo Member G's uh, concerns or comments actually about reporting to the roundtable and the community about flights, uh, the data basically as you, when we get to that point, uh, if those procedures are put in place, we need to have a mechanism that's really uh, on a regular basis. We don't wanna wait a six month or a nine month. We need kind of regular reporting. So we are up to speed seeing the report uh, coincide and correlate with what the public is telling us and what they're hearing on the, on the ground. Uh, sometimes we have seen the disconnect between reports and what people are hearing and experiencing on a daily basis. So if we could make sure that SFO would be uh, providing those reports for us, I think that would be extremely helpful uh, and you know, getting us to continue to partner if we need to uh, moving to make sure that this, the intent is here is to eventually uh, tests enough flights to figure out how this could be helpful. And clearly we don't know today, but unless we do test, have more flights and collect more data, we will never know. So that's really where we are here. And let me, before I conclude my comments, uh, add my thanks to United Airlines for volunteering and providing uh, their flights and uh, to help us come to some kind of uh, information based on test versus model. Okay, those are my comments at this point. I see member Schneider has her hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, my new ballywick is unintended consequences. I would just hope that the members and the public understand. On one hand, from my perspective and six years on round table, this will allow flights to get in during bad weather It'll allow flights to turn around more quickly uh, so that hopefully they leave and get out of our airspace before it is the night, before it's 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. That's the one advantage that I see on this. But the reality, I think, is that this will allow SFO to move from its 57 million passengers that they had pre-COVID to the projected 71 million passengers. And to do that, what was told to us at that time was the planes would get bigger. So for departures, a noise for the close in cities, that means more noise more frequently. But I think what it means to the Palo Altans and everybody else over or under these arrivals is you in theory might be quieter per flight, but your cumulative flight noise will be greater and your incidents between flights will become almost more const uh, last night I was up from 11.20 to 1.15 with departures on top of each other. So there was no break in the noise at all. So for you guys with GBAST, although safer, glad to hear that there's an additional benefit, fewer whatever it's called when you miss the runway and you have to fly around again. Yay, that's great. Um, but ultimately you're gonna have, I believe you're gonna have more cumulative, cum <laughs> sorry, cumulated noise. And it's gonna be happening more often, even if the level of noise is less. And that's that other issue that we try to talk about with the FAA, with their noise metrics, it's one incident. Doesn't matter if it lasts 30 seconds or two minutes, it's one incident. So, um, I mean, I support this in general. Now here's where I have to be nasty. Millbrae, of course, is right next to SFO. We had one neighborhood three, flood three times just this past winter. We have an agreement with SFO that they have not lived with. Now that's a different subject, but fool me once, shame on me, fool me, or fool me, fool that. Anyway, be careful because our experience is the airport has not lived up to its memorandums of understanding. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Member Schneider. Let me, for your comments, and let me turn those comments to a kind of question, if I may. Uh, Paul or anyone from SFO, would the innovative procedure have any impact on the traffic of the airplanes coming in, or is that a factor? For future traffic, basically what I'm saying, let's say the plan is, uh, you know, the projection for SFO to have how many flights or how many passengers coming in, does this make what is the plan more or just kind of, if you speak a little bit about that. 
I, I, I think Doug actually got his hand up before I was going to go. So uh, Doug, if you got want it. to first, I'll follow. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I appreciate this question coming up because I've, I've heard this um, raised a few times in, in some of our meetings. And I think it's an important question to, to cover. And that is, uh, what impact does GBAS have on the overall flight capacity at SFO? Does GBAS allow SFO to operate more flights? And the, uh, the answer is it does not. Uh, because really what constrains the number of flights that can operate at SFO is runways. The fact that our runways, number one, intersect with one another, and the fact that our runways are so close to one another. Those two factors are really what constrain how many flights total can operate at our airport. And the only way to really change that is to build more runways. And SFO has no plans in any projects to do that. So Anne's right. In bad weather, GBAS could reduce delays and could reduce the likelihood that the 6 p.m. flight is now a midnight flight by keeping things more on time. But I think about a day like today when it was perfectly clear, we're at our maximum ability to land airplanes. They're coming in side by side because both flight crews can visually see one another. GBAS isn't going to improve on that. GBAS can't do anything to raise that number anymore. So for that reason, GBAS will not increase the number of flights that our airport could handle. Only runways would do that, and we're not building any more. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, see, Vice Chair Royce hand is up. Yes, thank you. I uh, appreciate the questions and just had a couple of follow-ups. I'm, I'm a little... Uh, Curious, I expect, I expect with respect to the length of time the airport's anticipating for them to get hard data for them to make a conclusive decision on it. Uh, clearly, if it's not, if it's a safety issue, I can understand acting quickly. But if it's not a safety issue, are you looking at six months, nine months, a year before you conclude that it works or doesn't work? And I say that in the context you've said you spent six years already, spent millions of dollars on it. I'm not expecting you to be want to quickly say it doesn't work, but what's a reasonable time that you're looking at, number one? And number two, I'm a little bit worried about what criteria you use and what measurements you're using. Uh, we've talked a little bit about averages, and a lot of us are concerned about averages hiding the actual impact of noise. So I'm a little bit concerned what metrics might be used. And then thirdly, I would just make a general comment. Uh, I think the airport and all of us have to be super concerned about what we tell the public because I do think there's a lack of public trust in what they hear from governments and from FAA and everybody else nowadays based on experiences with next gen and everything else. So I think we have to bend over backwards to make sure that we're responsive. And if we're saying that we're gonna approve this on the condition that it works, that we put conditions in it that can actually measure that and enables us to reverse it if in fact it doesn't. So I'd, I'd pay a little attention to that. So with that, uh, I don't know if it's Doug or Paul or who might wanna to respond to that. Yeah, Al, great questions. And, uh, and I agree with, uh, with your point, because for us, this is really a journey that began after 2015, when we really saw and heard in these roundtable meetings, the impact that NextGen was having in our communities and an interest in uh, doing something that we would have control over. Uh, and that's really what's been driving this whole process. And so, yes, we are very much cognizant of kind of um, the groundwork that was laid uh, with communities through NextGen and wanting to kind of learn some lessons from that, if you will. And so I, I would say, you know, it's in our best interest to um, be flexible, to be ready to, and that's the thing that we like about this is that we do have control over these procedures. We still need to spend time developing exactly what those metrics look like. And that's a process that we would picture involving this group in doing. And like I said, we're going to have years to do this before we're actually flying these procedures. Uh, the other part is I don't know that uh, in these discussions, we can certainly talk about timeframes, but I think we need to maintain flexibility. In other words, if it's very clear very quickly that a procedure isn't performing the way that we thought it would, uh, we need to allow ourselves that flexibility to uh, shut it off, understand more about it, um, and uh, evaluate next steps. So uh, I, I think you've raised good points. I think that these are still some of the some of the details you're looking for are things that we need to develop. Uh, we've got time to develop it, and it's in our best interest to um, to maintain flexibility with that. 
Thank you, Doug. I would just put some time around that because I, I, well, I applaud the innovation and the fact we need to try stuff to try to solve the problem. We just can't hope it gets solved by itself. I also want to make sure we put the right safeguards in place to reassure the public that if it doesn't work, it will be shut down. And that will deal a little bit with criteria we use to evaluate it. So thank you for your comments. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Member Taylor, I apologize. I should have gone to you right after my comments, but I didn't see your hand and I overlooked it. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Handy. Um, I have a question and a comment, um, and that is, what will it take um, so that both the, actually all arrival and departure of flights will have permanent noise monitoring? Um, what will it take to get there? It is hard for me to approve this, honestly unless we're continuously collecting data. And I'm not sure who that question is for, um, Chair Hindi. I believe I can answer it. Thank you. As far as all arrival and departure flights, we do monitor those. Now, the question is how far away from the airport? We are limited in our ability to do that. And also revenue diversion is one thing that the FAA does watch the airport for. And so in other words, we can't put noise monitors all over Northern California. There's just no way to do it. And so um, we do have, frankly, far more monitors than most airports in the world. And so I believe we have a good constellation to be able to capture the noise at the uh, lower altitudes. I have a, a follow-up question, and that is just based on um, site A through F, um, is it possible to have regular monitoring along those sites um, so that there is more than the data that we have now? Um, that could be a loaded question. Uh, the reason I say that is many of these sites that we that I selected were private homes. And um, we were out there for quite some time initially, and two months. And some of the homeowners might not be willing to have us back. So we might be scrambling to find alternate sites. Um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to go back. Um, I'm about ready to bring the report and carry them to the uh, um, people that allowed us into their backyards. And that way they could see the information that was gathered while we were at the location. Thank you. And I appreciate that. And if there's anything I can do to volunteer to help with that process, because I think it was extremely important and helpful. Um, and then my, my comment is, I, one of the reasons why I have this, uh, this background is because this is the community I, I represent. Um, the area that is not green is the area that is under the flight path. And so um, I do represent Menlo Park, but neighboring area is North Fair Oaks and also East Palo Alto. And my concern is that, um, that the communities that are normally overlooked, under-resourced, re underserved, underrepresented, will be disproportionately impact by this change. And if, um, and if that happens, um, it, for me, it, it, it doesn't make sense for me to vote yes on something that's potentially going to have a negative impact on my community, my city, and the neighboring areas. And so, so I'm not sure how to, how to get in the direction that everyone else wants to go in, but I just want to put that out there. The other is that um, right now, I know the city of Menlo Park and many cities um, in San Mateo County and other counties are updating their um, housing element. The city of Menlo Park is looking at um, their safety element and also an over a component of environmental justice. And so when making policy, I am hoping that at the round table can also um, implement some type of environmental and social justice overlay, because if we don't, um, we will continue to harm the communities that we keep saying that we are putting first. Thank you. Oh, thank you for those comments and for those questions. Um, uh, I think uh, let me echo and support your request that monitors uh, on those areas that are be applied will be tested should really be uh, available. Otherwise, how are we going to collect the data to understand the impact? So thank you for your thoughtful comments and that request. Okay, um, Member Widmer. Sure, that was my last comment. I, I brought this up during the technical working group. Um, 
you know, and and then Miss Snyder uh, was very kind enough to bring it up again, which is is. Is, is a concern of the communities here, as well as I believe Palo Alto has brought this up several times. We've looked at independent, you know, single flights coming in. And I understand you got to do more measurements and things like that. And, you know, and I think that that's, that's a good thing. However, you, you know, when you have a ribbon of flights, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to narrow the number, the, you know, the variation of the flight path. So it's not just going to be a one-off situation. It's going to be a constant noise. And it starts to really impact the communities of Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, East Menlo Park, as well as Atherton, which, by the way, was included in that green area. Um, and, and it does. And, and, it, and I think that uh, we need to have some consideration and we've got to find a way to measure that as well, because that is really a noise shifting situation. So I just wanted to bring that up again from the, what I brought up in the technical working group. And it's, a, and it's a concern of mine as well as my residents and and also our past uh, board member who was who also served as chair when I spoke to her about it just today. So I want to bring that up one last time. So thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to my three quite my three instances. Thank you, Mr. Member Woodmer, for your comments. I appreciate your participation. Um, uh, with that, I don't see through the chair. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Member Dijabani. I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Well, after listening to everyone here and then really concerned again about, like, I don't want to repeat it, about the uh, green area with our neighbors in Fair Oaks. And uh, as they were saying, like, this is also an equity issue and many other issues that brought up um, as in, in when everybody was speaking tonight. Is it possible from uh, my board members to evaluate and put friendly amendments to this vote? because not feeling comfortable, I think that um, we need some kind of reassurance um, that these communities who are strongly impacted and that there's, like you said, there's no guarantee that if this doesn't work, then um, then it's a no-go to, to move forward. So I'm open to anything that um, my board members suggest, but I do think that it needs to be added something to the, this friendly amendment rather than just a straight vote um, through the chair and like to hear back from my board members. Thank you, Member Di Giovanni. Thank you, um, Chair. You're welcome. I see Member Schneider has her hand up. Member Schneider. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if that was a motion um, by either um, Cecilia or, or Pamela. I'm happy to second that. Um, but I'm going to go on the record that I have been very frustrated that my income, my community that is incredibly impacted by the airport is not considered a priority equity area, even though we flood, even though we had people die in December, um, because I guess historically we weren't. And, and Brian Perkins has been helping me with that. And unfortunately, the, the measurements are in there. So I, I very much want to support that we protect our traditionally impacted communities. I am saddened that there are communities, Millbrae, Burlingame and Hillsborough. I know that sounds really funny to talk about Hillsborough being badly impacted, but because that is based on the, the, the financial area and not the communities that live with really bad pollutants it's been a little frustrating for me. I've got 38 years working in the environmental field and I cannot protect my residents from air pollution or fuel spills or, or uh, micro particulates from jets taking off within a hundred feet over our homes. So I, I wanna support what Ms. Di Giovanni said and, and Ms. Taylor, absolutely. But I think the frame is too small on that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Schneider. So I, I do not believe I have heard a motion. I'm happy to entertain a motion, but for whomever is gonna be the motion maker, I would like to suggest that we add in the motion that SFO provide regular monitoring reporting to the round table in this community. Uh, so uh, with that, anyone would like to uh, 
Go ahead and move. I'm happy to entertain a motion. I see member Giovanni. And and through the chair, pardon me if um, we could take public comment on this item prior to the motion, please. Thank you, Ms. Montes, for reminding me about that. Thank you so much. So before uh, we do that, uh, anybody else from the membership? We spent quite a bit of time because it's a very important item that really will impact all of us. Uh, and I want to make sure that everybody got a chance to voice their uh, concerns, ask their questions, and have them answered, and any suggestions. I don't see any further hands with that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Montes, for reminding me. Let's go to the public. Thank you, Chairman. I do see two hands raised for this item, number four. So I will first call on Darlene Yapley, followed by Jennifer. Ms. Yapley? Some TWG members believe that proceeding with these approaches are okay because you can deactivate if there's more noise. If that's true, we need bulletproof safeguards in place. Member G, you're on the 99 yard line. We need to get it over the finish line. You cannot approve something you haven't even come up with the criteria for, where the monitors are gonna be committed to, Paul Hanna mentioned that the FA is the only one that has access of whether a flight is a GLS flight or not. If you don't even know if it's a GLS flight, how are you going to compare? There's four things you need in place. This is the criteria. You have to have usage data of the GLS procedure. You don't get that unless the FAA gives you the tool and and they're gonna be, and that you all feel comfortable that that's going to detect what you're looking for. Number three, who is doing the analysis? What is the analysis? What are you looking at? Ms. Yapley? Yes. Uh, we lost you for a minute. I would love to hear everything that you had said. Uh, we lost the usage, we, we heard the usage data and then we lost you. Would you please repeat that and I'll extend your time. Okay, the usage data, you need to know whether it's a GLS flight or not. You cannot tell that without the FAA using their tool to tell you. This isn't just a normal flight. The plane has to be equipped and you need to know it's flying the flight. Second of all, you need noise monitors. The answers I heard are generic. What, Palo Alto doesn't have a permanent monitor. None of the monitors A through E were permanent monitors. So who is going to get a monitor that's gonna detect whether these flights are gonna be compared or not? Number three, who is going to do the analysis? Where are the resources to do the analysis? And what is the analysis gonna be like? We don't want averages. The last one and the most important one is the deactivation criteria. You can't approve something without criteria. I mean, how can you say we'll create the criteria? What if you don't agree on the criteria? Is it gonna stop? So someone's gotta create the criteria. There's no plan. There's no bulletproof conditions. There's no commitment how and when this deactivation will happen. So I, I, you know, we have an 8 dB negative possibility on the test flights. We have to feel that there's some assurances to this. And that's why I urge you, you can approve all the other ones. They're running the overlays now. You can approve the other innovative approaches, but the ones that we know that there's been negative, please don't approve those. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Yapley. I will now call on Jennifer, followed by Greer Stone. Jennifer, please accept this request. i your microphone and begin speaking. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm gonna step back a little bit on this and go back to the seven years or six years that this has been in place. Um, about five years ago, I had asked why the FAA is not doing their community involvement which is uh, for precision-based uh, navigation. And this has to do with NEPA. And I would say that a CADEX probably costs the FAA nothing, but an, a higher level review is maybe one to $2 million. And those are resources to assess noise. And one of the reasons you do an EA is when the significance of impacts is not well understood. And when there are extraordinary circumstances, which I would say this is one today where the 65 DNL is not a good threshold criteria, if an EA would be done, it wouldn't just help um, East Palo Alto or the communities down south, it would also help the communities that are close to the airport. And so I just want to point out that the, the 
party that is missing in this entire agreement is the FAA because um, we actually have a long history of agreements that are between the community and SFO that have not worked separate from the one that Ms. Schneider has referred to. So I think we have to know who the parties are to this agreement, what level of review. And finally, there is an executive order that says that flight paths have to be created um, when there is a, a social justice community to involve them. And as you're aware, none of those communities have been involved. And I, in Palo Alto, I, I don't feel represented right now. And so I do think that all of the things, you're in the right neighborhood, but there's a lot more to learn here. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I will now call on Greer Stone, followed by Peter Grace. Mr. Stone, please accept this request, unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Hindi and honorable members of the SFO Roundtable. My name is Greer Stone. I'm the Palo Alto City Council liaison to this roundtable. As you're aware, Palo Alto continues to dedicate significant time, energy, and resources into our concerns of the health and safety implications of air traffic and noise generated by flights into and out of SFO. In this pursuit, we have obtained a consultant to assist in the analysis of flight paths and their impacts on the Palo Alto community. And I was glad to hear that was discussed tonight in, in part. I understand there are many who believe the GLS approaches will be quieter, but this isn't supported by the data in our consultant's report that shows at least GLS approach seven is almost eight decibels louder than the modeled approach indicates. If GLS, uh, GLS approach seven materializes, that'll be more than six decibels louder than the RNAV approach. This discrepancy in the data needs to be further researched and understood before making any final decisions. And at the very least, SFO should provide an explanation as to why there is such a wide discrepancy in the data. I was glad that Mr. Reindell uh, acknowledged the SFO study is an inadequate sample size and actions shouldn't be taken until we have some clearer understanding of that. The priority really should be on fixing SURFER at this point. Yeah, and we hope that in conjunction with working on improving SURFER, SFO can work on designing a more innovative approach that will equ equitably reduce noise for all impacted cities. I do appreciate being allowed to time to speak tonight and thank you for considering the voices of those impacted communities like Palo Alto who don't have a voice on this round table. We are working with SFO to schedule another GBAS community meeting, but have not yet, at least to my knowledge, received a date by SFO. Uh, you are all, as always, welcome to attend that community meeting and hear from our residents when it is scheduled. I, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Council Member Stone, and for sharing your comments and your thoughts with us. Thank you. And I did see Mr. Grace's hand raised, but it is no longer up, Chairman. Um, so we do not have any more virtual hands raised for this item. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Montes. So let me bring it back to the membership then at this point. And uh, if there are any further discussion, if not, let's. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion. Uh, Member Giovanni. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah, clarify things like, like you said, um, Chair, that, yeah, I didn't make a motion and that um, a lot of this is um, uh, really impacting so many communities and a lot of this is questionable. So uh, with my colleagues that, that actually live close to the airport, as well as all the other ones that are impacted. So I just wanted to clarify that and want to do what's right for all of us together, because that's what we're here to support one another. So I just want to make sure that that's clarified. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. I'm looking for a motion. If no one wants to make a motion, uh, let me see. Do I see any hands up? I do see a member Taylor hand up. Thank you, Chair Handy. And after listening to public comment, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is how to incorporate all of the concerns in a motion. Um, I agree with um, Member Snyder in making, uh, it, making it inclusive of whatever we're doing. So it's not based on demographics, it's based on location. 
um, where folks live and how they're impacted um, by the airport. So in saying all of that, <laughs> Chair Hendy, I, it would be great to give just a little bit of direction on how to incorporate all of the concerns that have been brought up um, by members um, in a motion if we are still planning on moving forward, unless this item can actually be held off on voting. Okay, let me, let, I mean, uh, it is my intent to have an action being taken on this item, but obviously this is not my sole decision. This is a membership decision and we will have to go to a vote, but let me get a clarification from uh, the SFO team as to the timeline or to if they have any responses to the comment and the concerns that were raised by members of the public and the membership as well. Um, I just to comment on those. Uh, number one, I I, uh, I certainly appreciate some of the concerns. I think that the challenge throughout this process has been um, the ability to measure this in real time. Um, and as you know, we were very fortunate to have uh, an airline partner that was willing to operate flights. But you know, we talked about it with Jeff G earlier tonight, and that is it. It really takes flights to validate. The model. The model alone is nothing more than that. Um, so I think that's really the, uh, the, the conundrum we find ourselves in is that um, um, we need real world experience to validate what we think will be of benefit. I think you've heard tonight uh, our commitment uh, and the speed at which we're able to terminate any procedure that is having a negative impact. And that's really what we've been talking about throughout is the idea that uh, whatever we're doing here does no harm. And if we have an indication that it does, we've got that ability to deactivate it. Um, in terms of, I acknowledge the, the fact that this GBAS procedure, this concept has varying levels of benefit depending on the communities that you're in. If you live in a community where um, aircraft don't approach over your community, maybe they take off over your community. I acknowledge the fact that GBAS won't be of much benefit. GBAS is more of a benefit to those communities where aircraft coming into land at SFO overfly those communities. So um, that is certainly the byproduct of what this technology can do. Um, but it's really, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's coming back to what can we do? Uh, what's within our control to try and make a positive difference. Okay. So uh, thank you. I, I, I concur with you, uh, Mr. Yekel, that definitely you have to have the flies to collect the data to see if this works or it doesn't work. I have no doubt in my mind about that. The second th part is I think for me, as far as the activation criteria uh, that Ms. Yapley has raised, I, I have enough answers for myself that this will be it done in a timely manner that if we find out, if, if it, we determine that this is not working and this is creating noise, that this will be dealt with in a rather a timely manner that will be put on hold, try to figure out what's going on, or if it is something that's unfixable, it will be terminated. Am I correct in my assessment? Okay. Now, as far as noise monitoring, I think that is critical component for us to move forward because if we don't have noise monitoring uh, permanent uh, to a certain extent in those uh, areas that we are testing, how are we gonna collect the data? So that is something critical that member Taylor has uh, brought up as well as members of the public. Uh, is there any response from SFO? Probably if you don't have to commit today, if you need more time and uh, that's why I'm, I, my question was, do you, how critical is it that you would like to the round table to take action on this, or would you rather have time to respond to those uh, concerns? Let if, uh, if more technically astute members of the SFO team want to respond to the noise monitor thing, I'll, I'll certainly give them that opportunity. Otherwise we can get back to you on that. I did mention earlier that it may be difficult to go back to the same locations, but uh, we, we agree that we definitely need more data and there's no way to get data unless you do it. So yes, we will definitely collect more data. Okay, and then let me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt who was speaking. 
Okay. And then regarding the usage data that uh, Ms. Uh, Yapley had uh, raised, is that an FAA proprietary information? Uh, that's what I understood from her. Is that accurate? If it's okay to speak to this, and, and I recognize Alana's on the call as well, um, we, as a project team right now, we are actively engaged both with uh, the Northern California TRACON, who is the, the typical kind of uh, entity that collects air traffic information uh, about the kinds of procedures that were utilized and, and maybe what kinds of aircraft were the ones that flew them. So we're engaged with them right now um, to basically get that kind of information immediately that we can share with, with this round table and certainly other residents of the Bay Area through our, our website to let them know first and foremost, how many overlay approaches are occurring because we know that's an important question that um, residents would like to have answered and, and many of you have indicated that. So we're working right now to get that, that information. We're also working with headquarters um, back, in, uh, back in DC um, to make sure that the newest tools that the FAA have developed internally um, can produce the most accurate um, results for helping our team um, identify how many GLS approaches have happened. But also that internal tool has a lot of information about the speed of the aircraft, the altitude of the aircraft, where it was. So, so those tools that the FAA has um, is gonna give uh, additional insight, first and foremost to air traffic, um, but then secondarily to the airport and our team to understand how did the aircraft do when they flew the GLS approach as it was cleared. So that tool, um, that tool we're working with NCT, uh, the, the TRACON and with headquarters um, to make sure that we can get that reporting access um, here within the next few months. So when, when you heard Doug describing our timeline for these innovative procedures being you know, 18 to 30 months, we're talking about trying to get that level of information within the next you know, two to three months maximum um, to be able to share and then uh, so that we'll have a confident you know, capability that we can then report on uh, in the future. I don't know, Alana, if there was more that you wanted to, to add to that, not to put you on the spot. I just, <laughs> okay, I see she's shaking her head no. So okay. I, I, that's what we're working on right now um, with that. Okay. Aspect. Thank you for that uh, answer. And just finally, if you have any comments or uh, if you would like to comment on the part of analysis, how is that gonna be done and resources to kind of speak a little bit about what Ms. Yapley has raised about analysis and no averages. Uh, any comments on that if you're prepared, if not, um, okay. Uh, so, I, with that, I'm going to move to, I see a couple hands raised, uh, Member Taylor, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a, a clarifying question. Do all of the innovative approaches need to be approved at once? If it's okay, I can I can answer that question. Sorry, I was putting my, my hand up, and I feel so terrible because I keep putting my hand up. But uh, Mr. Ortiz, uh, <laughs> Mr. Hanna, Mr. Hanna, please don't put your hand up. Feel free to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. I we really appreciate the time here tonight. So I, I want to be respectful. Um, the um, uh, I think the answer to to the question is um, no. Not every procedure that is currently um, that, that we have put forward as an innovative procedure needs to be, um, you know, approved or voted on or, or recommended for, for the airport to continue going forward. There are, um, there are a lot of different kinds of innovative procedures that we have put forward, um, all of which we believe achieve our, our project goals, um, which number one is noise reduction. So um, if there was a smaller subset that was of interest to, um, to the, the members here tonight, and those were the ones that they felt confident to push forward, um, we would absolutely be, be ready and willing to work with that um, and take things forward while maybe others needed to continue being evaluated. Um, I think our, our sincere interest on the project team is just you know, making sure that, that all of you are aware and your, your residents and your constituents are aware that these are the best procedures that we can come up with um, here and now for, for group one. Um, innovative concepts. And so, you know, we're very hopeful that that um, some of these are, are interesting and can give move forward and that we can find our project goals here of noise reduction. Okay, thank you. I see uh, former Chair Ortiz hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, just a follow up question with that, Mr. Hanna, just my recollection is that we divided this into different groups of uh, approaches the ones we're considering were the ones where the models showed that there was a reduction or no change in the noise. 
And that's why we decided to put, to even look at these. There was a whole set others where we had some questions about uh, uh, noise shifting and that we set aside and we were going to do further modeling. Uh, so these are the ones where we felt or where the modeling showed that there was going to be a decrease in noise. So, so just to put that in perspective, what we're saying is these are the ones the models say are going to reduce noise. This is what is going to be it's going to help these communities that we keep talking about. So to delay this, we're delaying, you know, giving relief to some of these communities. In some cases, it might not be dramatic. It might be small, but in average, and we just did, we talked about this, on average, we're going to provide relief to these communities. So, and, and I'll make a motion after I see there's a few of the consultants want to talk about this, but so, so the concern about the uh, the uh, monitors in Palo Alto is very, very good, and I think we need to address it. Uh, the concern of creating the, uh, the 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 parameters of where these procedures would be taken off that that's very important. I love what uh, Ms. Yapley said, so I appreciate that. But I think we need to find a way today to create a motion to move this forward, to bring relief uh, and to start collecting the data to see if it, in fact it does. We can't keep delaying this and saying, no, we need to start taking measurements to make sure that it is happening and we need to act accordingly. So I'm gonna shut up for a little bit, thank you. No, well, no, thank you, because this is really very important what you just said. And that's really where we are. Yes, we do all have concerns because of the unknown, but to, address the unknown, we have to really have some flights, have to start collecting some data and know what works and what doesn't work. And again, for me, let me echo what you said, the member Ortiz, that uh, we have to have, I think, the safety mechanism. And for me, I think there is a safety mechanism in this process here if we are able to deactivate whatever is not working. But we don't know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work until we fly them and uh, until SFO flies, not us, until we collect enough data. So that's where I'm at. So thank you for sharing those thoughts. And again, for also bringing up to everybody's attention that uh, the round table had said no to other innovative procedure that we did not see from the modeling that they are beneficial or they have the potential of being beneficial. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gene. I see his hand up. Thank you. Um, what, I wanted to clarify a couple points because I think it's important here um, as we're getting close to a motion. One is that um, I, I've always said from the very beginning that it's really not the roundtable's position to approve these procedures. What you're doing, um, I would suggest, is just to support San Francisco in implementing these procedures. Um, given the caveat that one, they can uh, deactivate them if something unpredicted occurs. And also, um, you're, again, I think it's important that you not actually approve these procedures because it's through San Francisco and the FAA to go through the approval process, but that basically ba based on our review and things you've heard tonight that you see perhaps no reason to not support implementation so that we can try to get that data that we need. And maybe your motion includes um, the monitoring that San Francisco said they would do and try to work between now and the 18 to 24 months when these procedures actually get implemented to come up with a reporting mechanism and the metrics and things like that, that you know work together with San Francisco in this interim to, to get that figured out. Um, in time for when they do implement them. So I just wanted to make those uh, points. Also, um, Mr. Or, or Member Ortiz was correct in that these were the ones that showed benefit or no change in noise levels. And there were a handful of others that we did not, that you did not ask me to review. There were two, however, that showed a change and that was those two to 10 left and 10 right. Um, but because they are so infrequently used and it would actually improve safety and reduce the number of missed approaches, meaning that ultimately it would probably be a cumulative noise reduction on a single event basis, we didn't necessarily see that. So I just wanted to 
not have people think that all of these nine were actually, as you stated, Member Ortiz, that they were either no change or a reduction in noise, because those two did uh, provide uh, a, a little bit of increase in, in some of the areas as they flew over the peninsula to land on 10 left and or right. Thanks, Mr. Randall. No, I, I, what you had mentioned, what for me most important that yes, the roundtable does not approve or disapprove what SFO or the FAA would like to do. That's their business. However, I think they coming in to us as part of their engagement, whether we have any um, objections, if you will, that or concerns, major concerns that they would need to address. And I think, uh, again, for me, it has enough a safety mechanism in it that we could uh, say, go ahead and proceed if you would like to continue on this path. And uh, uh, we, we could always, we continue this engagement with SFO because again, this is SFO and not the FAA that's doing these procedures. So um, I'm okay with that. And uh, I see a couple hands up, let me do those. And I would love to really conclude this item because we have other items we gave it it's due time and respect as it deserves, but I would like to move on to the next items on our agenda today. With that, let me go very quickly to Mr. Valdez who has his hands up. Thank you, Chairman Hindi. I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarification on the data collection and reporting. The GBAS report is largely based on other portable noise monitoring reports that the Roundtable has seen in the past, and the Roundtable has commented on those reports and the content of those reports. So we wanted to mimic, in a sense, uh, those reports, plus add some spe specific sections that compare non-GLS uh, to GLS approaches. Uh, we can continue those in the future uh, with the assistance of, of the Roundtable and continue to show uh, criteria as far as whether it increases or decreases uh, noise levels. We could also compare altitude and speed at certain areas along the flight path. So it's really a, a flexible uh, mechanism that we'll, we'll use in the future. And as far as showing averages, um, some of the tables and charts uh, use averages to summarize the raw data. And in the appendix of the GBAS report, we provided all individual single event noise levels. And in the future, and in, every, and in any report, we would also add the, the raw data, if you will, of each of the events that are being compared or on the report. Thank you for that clarification, very important. Okay, Member Taylor. Thank you, Chair Hendy. And I am supportive of all of the innovative approaches except the four Eddy. And also I would like to include the motion that we put the monitors back at the location site A through F if possible. Thank you. Okay, by Chair Um, If you're ready for a motion, Mr. Chair, I'd be willing to try to offer one. Happy to hear that. I think uh, Mr. Ortiz wanted to do that, but- uh, I, I, will defer, I will defer to Mr. Ortiz. <laughs> Member Royce, I appreciate it. I did write something down, so let's see how let's see how we like this. And I hope it addresses a member Taylor's concerns. I, I don't know that I will address that one procedure. So my motion is to support the procedures as presented with the understanding that we will continue robust monitoring in Palo Alto and we will develop criteria for the decommissioning of procedure, procedures where noise impacts prove to be higher. Okay, the, uh, uh, I would second that, uh, Mr. Ortiz. The, the only additions I was, I had, uh, was thinking of was adding a criteria that would include both uh, average and single event and that the reports be rendered to us on a regular basis. Uh, I, but, uh, I, I amend my motion to include your uh, comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will second that motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So I do have a motion from member Ortiz and a second from Vice Chair Royce. And uh, I see further discussion happening, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. I was hoping I didn't have to put my hand up again. Friendly amendment um, to not include the four Eddy um, only monitoring for those areas that would be helpful because Thank I Thank you, member Ortiz. Thank you. Thank you, uh, member Ortiz. I'm, I'm curious why uh, the member Taylor. 
I believe it will have a negative impact. I do not believe that averaging um, impact um, is a successful way to measure what is actually going to happen. And I live under the flight path. We have up to 20 hours of air traffic. I do not believe that is going to help us. I believe it will harm us. Thank you. I, I second the amendment. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's up for the author of the author of the amendment, Mr. Ortiz, if you would like to accept this amendment. But let me, before we do that, uh, I think Mr. Valdez addressed that concern, which is the reporting does have single events as well as averages, uh, and that's going to be continue the way it's going to be reported. Is that correct? And that's I think part of the amendment, um, part of the motion from Mr. Ortiz. Would that address your concern, Ms. Taylor? No, shaking her head. Okay. All right, Mr. Ortiz, you are the maker of the motion. Uh, would you like to accept this friendly amendment? Mr. Chair, as long as Mr. Royce continues to second it, I will leave the motion as is. Okay, Mr. Royce. I, I would support the motion as is. And I, and I say that because I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, the modeling does support that this has a beneficial impact. And I do think okay. we need to be innovative and a little aggressive in our approaches. And as long as we have a deactivation procedure that would apply in total and in parts, I think that's a protective measure. So I would, uh, I would support the motions originally made. And okay, second. thank you. So I would like to conclude this, but I see Mr. G's hand is up before I call, uh, roll, before I do a roll call, Mr. G. Thank you, Chair Hindi. I'd like to offer um, the maker and the second of the motion a little bit more specificity in the motion. And that would be that a noise monitoring program be established along the flight paths of GLS that documents a number of factors, aircraft, altitude, date, time, weather, and then of course the noise. That that data be shared on a regular basis. I'm gonna just make this up on a, every three months with our noise consultant for review and assessment. That criteria be established to determine when an innovative approach that we're talking about tonight is the determined to be detrimental to a community, where that be increased noise of more than two dB or whatever, or noise shifting, and that a process and a timeline be established that when a flight path is determined to be detrimental, what that process is in the timeline for removal of that flight path. And that I come back to this roundtable board um, I don't know if it's at the next meeting or the meeting after, but before these flight procedures are implemented. Thank you, Member G. I'll go to Member Ortiz. Mr. Chair, I think that uh, the motion that's presented uh, kind of addresses some of those issues in more general terms. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it as is. Okay. Uh, all right. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Uh, Ms. Uh, Stop there, would you please get the roll, take the roll. Yes, thank you, Chair. City and County of San Francisco Airport Commission. Yes. Thank you. San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. Yes. Thank you. Airport Land Use Commission. Yes. Thank you. Town of Atherton. No. Thank you. City of Burlingame. Yes. Thank you. Town of Colma. Yes. Thank you. City of Daly City. Yes. Thank you. City of Foster City. No, I would like to have Mr. G's specific, uh, I think it, the details will be beneficial to us. I would happy to get another motion there if it dispels. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Town of Hillsboro. Yes. Thank you. City of Menlo Park. No. Thank you. City of Millbrae. No. Thank you. City of Redwood City. No. Thank you. City of San Bruno. No. Thank you. The motion does not pass. Okay, uh, thank you. You, you missed Woodside? Oh, I'm sorry, town of Woodside. Yes. Oh, the motion does pass. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. So what's the count, Ms. Um, Stockdale? Uh, eight, four. 
Okay, thank you. Six All seconds. right, well, motion, motion passes. And um, thank you everyone for your participation. This really was a robust discussion. I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, participation in this. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, move on to the next item. Bear with me here a second. This has been very lengthy. Okay, we're back to item number five uh, at the request, which is a letter to city of San Bruno on temporary development. This item came at the request of the San Francisco airport uh, asking whether the round table want to opine on the development plan of the Tamperan mall area, which uh, this item was discussed at the technical working group subcommittee meeting. While it is not on the purview of the round table to act on matters of land use, the subcommittee asked staff to draft a letter, but did not want to tell the city of San Bruno what to do. So this letter simply says, as it is in your packet, that there are currently plans to have a housing component within the 70 decibel CN C CNEL noise contour. Pair the FAA with that contour, individuals will be exposed to significant aircraft noise. As part of the letter, it is suggested that the city of San Bruno require any developer to use state-of-the-art technology and building material that might lessen the noise impacts for potential, potential residents. And just uh, uh, for transparency, I did reach out to member Hamilton prior to discussing this on the technical working group and shared with them what SFO has requested. I also contacted uh, the mayor Medina and I explained to him the same thing and uh, made it clear to both of them that the round table will not, and it's not in its purview to tell San Bruno what to do with its, uh, whether it's housing or any redevelopment that in their city. With that, I'm gonna open this for any discussion or questions if any member has about the letter to the city of San Bruno regarding the temporary redevelopment. Okay, seeing none. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and uh, move on to open it to the public to comment on item five, the letter to San Bruno. Thank you, Chairman. So I would like to remind members that they may press star nine to indicate your desire to speak if they're calling by phone, but I do not see any virtual hands raised for this item, Chairman. Okay, thank you so much. With that, uh, Ms. Stockdale, would you please conduct the roll? We have a motion, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. We need a motion. I didn't hear any objections, so I assume there's no objection. Um, I would be happy to entertain a motion to send the letter attached on your packet to the city of San Bruno. Mr. Hamilton. For maximum irony, I will make a motion that we send the letter <laughs> to the city of San Bruno. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, Ms. Taylor. I'll second. Thank you. I got a motion by member Hamilton, second by member Taylor. Uh, Ms. Stockton, now please conduct the roll. Okay. Uh, City and County of San Francisco Airport Commission. Yes. Thank you. San Mateo Board of County, sorry, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Airport Land Use Commission. Yes. Thank you. Town of Atherton. Yes. Thank you. City of Burlingame. No. Thank you. Town of Colma. Yes. Thank you. City of Daly City. Yes. Thank you. City of Foster City. Yes. Thank you. Town of Hillsborough. Yes. Thank you. City of Menlo Park. Yes. Thank you. City of Millbrae. I'm very torn on this one, so I think I'll abstain. Okay, thank you. City of Redwood City? Yes. Thank you. City of San Bruno? Yes. Thank you. Town of Woodside? Yes. Thank you. Your motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Stockdale. Moving on, we're gonna go ahead to presentation item number six, Title 21 Reporting Update. With us tonight, we have Ms. Lisa Awasasa, County of San Mateo Deputy Director of Community Development, who will present this item. Ms. Awasasa. 
Thank you, Chair Hindi. Good evening, and good evening to members of the roundtable. Um, I'd like to just make um, provide a brief update on the Title 21 quarterly noise report procedures uh, for your item number six this evening. By way of background, you may recall that the Roundtable's Aviation Technical Consultant, HMMH, provided an update on this topic at the uh, Roundtable's February 2nd regular meeting. That presentation gave an overview of the Roundtable's current procedures for compliance with Title 21 re requirements, describing how Roundtable staff, in collaboration with the SFO Noise Office and HMMH, produce, review, and submit the reports to Caltrans. I won't go over that again now. It's summarized in the uh, memo in your packet, but I did want to address a couple of questions that came up following the presentation at the very end of the February 2nd meeting. Um, and they're just, it was at the very tail end of the meeting, there really wasn't time to address um, those questions. Um, one of those was regarding San Mateo County's role in Title 21 compliance. Um, the Title 21 statute requires the, the county where certain airports are located to submit the quarterly reports to uh, their aeronautics division. However, because SFO is located in San Mateo County, but is owned and operated by the city and county of San Francisco, we have a fairly unique situation. Um, in this case, the county of San Mateo's um, uh, compliance with uh, Title 21 has been through its participation in the round table. Um, so to clarify, it is the round table staff um, as, as, as employed and managed by San Mateo County, not any other county department or personnel that has been involved in um, the completion of the Title 21 uh, compliance tasks. Secondly, questions came up from members about the availability of historical quarterly reports for years 2009 to 2016. While the historical data needed to compile these reports has been available, the reports were not produced. Um, however, the SFO Noise Office has now decided to go ahead and produce those reports and it's estimated they will be available to the roundtable and the public in the fall of this year, so 2022. Uh, finally, as described in the memo in your packet, roundtable staff plans to work with HMMH to make a minor adjustment to the current uh, Title 21 report procedures that will uh, require less of HMMH's time to review the reports, and that will save the roundtable some money on consultant fees. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and take any comments that you have on this topic. Thank you so much, Ms. Aldessa. Any questions from membership? Ms. Schneider. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Title 21 uses FAA CNEL data, uh, which means it does not take into account low frequency noise. And then um, Title 21 is used for all of the freeways and El Camino Real, et cetera. What I am finding is that we have siloed data. So the airport lives off on its own and the freeway lives off here. But in my community, that is only two miles wide, plus the information that we received from the ground-based noise study that the noise actually gets louder as it goes up the hill, low frequency noise. Title 21, does not reflect the reality of what people in Millbrae and some of the other communities experience. I can best speak for Millbrae. So in our comments, I don't know if it made it through to the congressional hearing for the FAA, using only high frequency noise, using only not counting the noise that happens in back of runways is not a real reflection. And, and great, let's get this Title 21 reports in, but that is what has allowed 101 to expand and expand and expand for the overpasses into SFO right next to one of one of my neighborhoods and, and a San Bruno neighborhood with that noise going directly in with Caltrain's noise, with BART's noise, with someday high-speed rail noise, all within basically several, less than a mile on that. So Title 21 is inefficient or is insufficient in actually showing a true reflection of what is happening here. So what I would love to see our legislators do and our county do is that we ask for legislation that changes Title 21, that takes into account low frequency noise. Um, I believe, and I hope some of the public will, will correct me on this, that the anime tool takes into account both A and C weighted noise. And if that can get into Title 21, we will actually have data that is truly reflective of what the people here experience. Thank you. Thank you, Member Schneider. 
I do not have any other hands raised up. So for that, thank you, Ms. Ozessa for the report. And we move on to item number seven, Chairman's update. I'll try to be brief as we are running behind. Just wanted to inform everyone that the round table is on track to bring the code of conflict of interest before members for a vote at the June meeting, after which the code will go to the FPPC for review. Vice Chair Royce and I working with members that submitted comments and staff submitted a letter of testimony to the US House of Representatives Subcommittee on Aviation on behalf of the round table. The letter, as you know, was included in the meeting packet. We focused on six areas of concern, which were the following, nighttime noise, the use of updated noise metrics to better reflect the community's concern and annoyance, ground-based noise, environmental justice, NEPA and the request that the FAA consider human health equal to efficiency in the decision-making and community engagement officer should be given greater responsibility or authority and authority to make decisions. Representative Speer also submitted a statement for the record. Her key topics included the deficiency of the noise metrics used by the FAA and the definition of annoyance from airport and aircraft noise needs to be significantly improved. To change the FAA prioritization of airspace management to include the reduction of aviation noise and environmental impacts as currently, as currently efficiency trumps noise mitigation around the clock and in areas far removed from the airport. The FAA is not sufficiently resourced to reduce noise. It should be easier for an airport to obtain approval for a flight path change. The committee should amend our statutes to again allow airports to create and enforce curfews. As a reminder, the UC Davis Aviation Noise and Emission Symposium will be held May 1st through 3rd. There are discounted rates for community members. It can be attended in person, online, or hybrid. We also received update from the FAA on staffing at the regional administrator's office. As of April 4th, she will go on extended leave from the FAA. Okay, so this is uh, about uh, Ms. Um, Ra Raquel. Raquel, she will be, uh, as of April 4th, she will be on extended leave from the FAA for personal reason and expect to be out of the office for about a year. Ms. Tamara Swan, will serve as acting regional administration in the first part of her extended leave. And Ms. Fabiola Garcia will continue serving as acting deputy regional administrator over the next several months. I have copied them both in this message under this leadership, the FAA Western Pacific Regional Administrator Office will continue our work with the SFO Roundtable. So this is the message we have received from the FAA and I wanted to make sure share it with all of you and the members of the public. And that, is, that concludes my report and are there any questions or comments? And actually before I ask, uh, yeah, are there any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to item number eight, San Francisco Airport Director Report. And I believe Mr. Yackel is gonna be delivering that report. Yes, thank you, Chair Hindi. I've uh, just got a couple of comments, then I'll turn it over to Bert for a slide or two that he might have. Uh, just a quick update on uh, traffic recovery at the airport. We finished the month of March at about 67% of pre-pandemic passenger levels, so we continue to close that gap. Uh, last Friday, we saw the busiest day at our checkpoint since the pandemic began, so we are seeing that recovery. We do think it'll still be a while before we get back to 100% of pre-pandemic levels. Our forecasts right now are for us to finish this year at about 75% of pre-pandemic levels. So uh, we've still got more ground to recover and really it's more in the international sector where we need to see more of that recovery happening, happening although there are some positive signs there. Um, going hand in hand with that, there are several new carriers that are planning to launch service at SFO. Uh, there's a Canadian low-cost carrier, Flare, which is launching two flights a week to Edmonton on April 14th. They're going to operate a 737. That flight comes in at 5, 10 p.m., leaves at 6 p.m. 
Another Canadian carrier, Air Transat, launches twice weekly flights to Montreal on May 19th, also a 737. That's a morning flight, 8.30 arrival, 9.15 a.m. departure. Condor, a German airline, starting three flights a week to Frankfurt, May 19th, 7.67, 7.15 p.m. arrival, 9.15 p.m. departure. And Breeze Airways just announced plans. This is a domestic U.S. airline uh, launching two flights a week to Richmond, Virginia, May 25th, using an Airbus A220. This is the first domestic carrier to launch at SFO since Virgin America in 2007. Um, in addition, we are seeing several international carriers start to resume, resume service, the most recent being Level, a Spanish low-cost carrier starting service to Barcelona, resuming service on March 29th. So we are seeing some of that international traffic recovery. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Bert for a couple of his slides. Thank you, Doug. Go ahead and get our screen shared here for you. Uh, try and be quick. So as you've heard, our GBAS has been certified and operational. The flight checks completed on March 4th, and the system became available for use on March 14th. Uh, we've already heard that the airlines are eager to use it. Um, we don't have the exact counts yet, as you heard earlier, and we're trying to uh, get that data. Uh, any comments, please feel free to reach us at sfo.gbass.com. Uh, for an installation program update, wanted to quickly display those numbers on the replacement initiative and our second chance initiative. Um, there are almost 4,000 total potential eligible replacement uh, properties. Uh, we've received 940 applications. Um, currently in the design, 135 units. 45 are in construction, 19 have been completed. Satisfaction rates, 82.5. We're uh, trying to get that higher. Average dollar per home is uh, 27,000 just over. And the second chance, we had 434 homes eligible, potentially. Uh, we received 620 applications. Uh, the design uh, units and design right now, 45 in construction, 20. 44 have been constructed and the homeowner satisfaction rates, 97. So we're looking for an average dollar uh, value per property on the second chance at $91,000. Um, information can be found on the uh, noise.flyespo.com as well as many other information features for that. Uh, real quickly on a name, we're dealing with the data. Uh, we're trying to dial in the sites. It does require that we actually physically tune the sites. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, and working for that, it's taking a little longer than we figured, a little longer than they figured too, uh, for our partner in Suite. And here's a draft of what we intend to share in the future. Uh, we've also been asked where the uh, sea weighted. Uh, we're gonna have to find a place to shoehorn that in. So um, we may have to really do some modification to our report to have it all um, large enough to be seen. I thank you for your time and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Bert, for that. And members of the round table, anyone has any questions or comments on the director's report? I'm seeing none. So on once. Okay, moving on to item number nine, subcommittee's reports. I will start with the technical working group. I will do that report here for you. The technical working group met on March 18, 22. The subcommittee discussed the request from the airport to write a letter to the city of San Bruno, which we already took action on this item. And uh, I'm not gonna bore you with it. You already seen the letter. Uh, HMMH presented its evaluation of the noise results from the test flights of the GBAS procedure. And again, this was shared with you today from Gene. And, um, um, you already heard all that, so no, no need for me to really to go over it again. Uh, Member Schneider brought House Bill 6270 to the attention of the subcommittee. This is the Advanced Aviation Infrastructure Modernization Act 
that deals with drones and autonomous aircraft usage. Just for information purposes, this item will be added to the next agenda of the technical working group. For those who are interested, you could join us and uh, chime in. And a member of the public, I think Ms. Yapley early on mentioned about the composition of the uh, subcommittees. And I just wanna reiterate one more time, although there were three members selected, any member and all members are welcome to attend and participate fully in the, uh, all the subcommittees. Uh, it's really the purpose of having three just for quorum nothing more and nothing less. So with that, let me go to my colleagues who were on the technical working group meeting in case I missed anything or would they like to highlight something? I know Vice Chair Royce was there and uh, other members, if anyone who was on the technical working group and I missed anything, please uh, raise your hand. I'm happy to give you the floor. Okay, seeing none, so that concludes my report. Bill, I have uh, his hand up. Uh, Mr. Chair, I I'm sorry. Mr. Whitmer, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Oh, that's all right. All right. Um, one of the things that came up during our discussion in the previous item was the correlation. There were the request of the correlation of the information from Palo Alto to the test that we've done here. And that came up again in the discussion again today, and there was no answer. So I assume that there was no action taken on it, which, you know, I was, I was a little disappointed in. So but uh, that was a specific request that came out of that technical working group. Thank you very much for listening. Sure, thank you for bringing that. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I would like to move to item 9B, which is a ground-based noise subcommittee. Ms. Schneider, please proceed with your update. Thank you, Chair. I've got to find the report. Take your time. Um, Not really, ground -based but take your time. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, we had a, a more casual meeting. So for the public, you are always welcome uh, where we can get into a, a more give and take discussion on that than at the form, more formal round table or working group meeting. Uh, what we did talk about, or we heard from the airport about how the use of auxiliary power units is working at the gates and that uh, aircraft are required to use ground power and discontinue the use of APUs within five minutes after clocking, uh, clocking in. And I may not have said that exactly well. So for my community, especially with the gates uh, within several hundred feet or several hundred yards of residential units, that's good to know. But the APUs continue to be a source of both air pollution and noise. We learned that SFO is in the process of creating a report for uh, run-ups Run-ups for the new members are an engine after it has had maintenance work, a jet engine. They have two locations at the airport. I think Bert may have said there's three now. And they have to run the engines for uh, at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. I think they're required to not go longer than 30 minutes. Bert did report that there was one time where a, a run-up lasted for three hours. I think my residents in San Bruno heard that one quite distinctly. Um, sadly, the airport, the uh, airline or the maintenance crew, however that is done, there is a fine and the fine goes to SFO as opposed to the fine for that noise violation coming to the communities that are most impacted by that. The airport also re reported that 34% of ground handling equipment, the tugs, the baggage loaders are electric and they plan to be 70% electric by 2023 and 100% electric by 2040. So that is good for all of us for our air quality as well as, as noise because electric vehicles are quieter. The action items from this meeting was a timeline from the airport for the EIR for Terminal 3 and Concourse H expansion. We were told that the gates will not be pointing into San Bruno or Milbrae, but let's see how that comes out of the EIR. Uh, we asked if it was possible to get maps that show where the run-up areas are and the percentage and times of usage for each run-up. Uh, chart the mitigation items from the GBN report and Basically, what that means is the current under FAA guidelines and using only a weighted noise and the CNEL metric, the averaging over a, a year, it totally discounts the flights that take off over 
Milbrae and land over Milbrae. It doesn't even show that they happen, nor does it show the real impact of where low frequency noise as it runs behind and to the sides of runways. So getting a chart that actually shows the real noise experience is important to my city. I can't speak for the others. Um, operational issues. Um, the note here says intersection of takeoffs for lighter aircraft. And I, I think we'll have to come back and address that one. And can we get the airport or the airlines to agree at night to use the gates that do not face Bayside Manor and Marina Vista neighborhoods? Uh, because again, those, those jets then directly aim at these neighborhoods and these neighborhoods are literally just a hundred, several hundred yards away from them. So we're pending that and pending a discussion of curfew and what that might mean. Uh, we did have a request for the legislative committee to look at an amendment for Title 21, which would be a legislative action and a request that staff bring back the anime process for a detailed discussion at the technical working group. Uh, Ground-based noise will not meet again until July. That's too long to wait on a neme, as a neme seems to be the one basis that may actually show a true reflection of ground-based and low-frequency noise. So a request to the working group, please put a neme on the next agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ground-based noise chair Schneider. Appreciate your report. Members, do you have any questions or comments on the report by Chair Schneider? Um, okay. Through the chair, I uh, yes. just want to thank both the chair and the vice chair for the letter. Uh, thank you for the ground-based noise comments. I will only add that the city of Millbrae added more detail, as well as the fact that as SFO expanded, Bayshore Freeway was actually moved right next to two Millbrae neighborhoods that did exist at the time. To me, that makes us a community of concern, a priority equity area, and that will be an action that the city of Millbrae will take because we can't seem to get any mitigation for any environmental problem um, because we're just not considered important enough. But And that is in our comments that I don't know what uh, Congresswoman Spears' office got into the congressional hearing. I attended the congressional hearing. Uh, they're still pretty much concentrated on next gen and nothing other than next gen. And I love the congressman from uh, the airport. I've just gone blank on the airport, Boston's airport. He was the only one that tried to hold uh, FAA and other staff accountable. Otherwise, it was throwing them softball questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your input and the cities of Melbourne's input as well. Thank you. I see uh, Mr. Perkins' hands is up. Mr. Perkins? Well, Councilwoman Schneider twice asked if her testimony had been submitted to the committee. It was. And in addition to that, there were 17 other comments from the public which were submitted, as was the comments, as were the comments of the Congresswoman. We're going to be circulating those. So you were, should be posted on our website soon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perkins. Yes, I did see those uh, that submittal from the Congresswoman and I did include member. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to items 9C and 9D. And I'm going to turn in to turn it on to Ms. Stockdale if we have any update on the legislative and work plan subcommittees. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to give everyone um, the dates of the the two subcommittee meetings, we have those set. So the legislative subcommittee will meet on Wednesday, May 25th at 1230 p.m. And the work plan update um, subcommittee okay. will uh, meet on Friday, May 20th at 10 a.m. So if you are interested in attending those meetings, those are the dates. And uh, we would love to have your input uh, for those committees. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Stockton. And again, everybody is welcome. As a matter of fact, we encourage the more the merrier. So please attend if you're able to. All right, Ms. Schneider. Through the chair, I'm sorry. I should say a big thank you to Ms. Stockdale, who helped me collect all of the action items from ground-based noise. My, uh, sorry, I forgot that. Thank you, Ms. Stockdale. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Vice Chair Royce. I, I would just add to what uh, Ms. Stockdale said on the legislative subcommittee. The first meeting, spring meeting, is May 25th. We are looking for any ideas or topics you would like to discuss. We are trying to incorporate learnings from the symposium, the Davis Symposium that occurs May 1st to the 3rd, and see if there's any topics there that might be of, of great interest. 
to this round table. So we'll be looking at that specifically. In addition, the letters we just sent to the, on the congressional aviation, there were some recommendations in those letters. In fact, the letter we sent, I think, not only covered six topics, they had like 10 specific recommendations in the body. So we'll be going through those, I anticipate as well, and see if there's any legislative follow-up that's needed. But would like to encourage additional membership on that committee. I think the comments made by Ms. Yapley are spot on. Uh, would love to have some representation, uh, a greater geographical representation within our roundtable than what we currently have. Although all members are not only invited, they are encouraged to attend. So with that, uh, those are my only comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Royce. Uh, I don't see any other members having their hands raised. So with that, I'm gonna move on to item number 10, members communication and announcement. So obviously thank you for the uh, subcommittee chairs for your reports and for your input and for your hard work on those subcommittees, really appreciate it. Moving to item 10, uh, member communications and announcements. Is, is there anything members would like to share with us or the public? Chair Hindi, we did get a request um, to go over the vote for item four. So if I could do that really briefly. Sure. Um, it was eight eyes and six no's. Uh, let me just read the eyes first were from the city and county of San Francisco Airport Commission, the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, the Airport Land Use Commission, the city of Burlingame, the town of Colma, the city of Daly City, the town of Hillsboro, and the town of Woodside. The no's were the town of Atherton, the city of Foster City, the city of Menlo Park, the city of Millbrae, the city of Redwood City, and the city of San Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dockdale, for that. I, I think it's important to hear it. Thank you. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and move on to public comments on items number six through 10. Ms. Montes, do we have any members of the public would like to comment on those items? Thank you, Chairman Hindi. I do see one hand raised for this item. So I will go ahead and call on Jennifer. Just give me one second to get the timer running. And please accept this request. Unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not. Um... I can't hear you. We can and hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, I'm going to assume that you can hear me, um, even though I can't hear myself. But um, what I wanted to mention is that I'm confused about Mr. Rendell's uh, comment to you that your approval doesn't mean anything. Because um, in the Freedom of Information Act information we got about the GBAS overlays that a resident in Palo Alto got and I've been looking at, it says that there's a community involvement form which is attached. It wasn't attached to the document. But um, pretty much, I don't know if you're aware, but the FAA, when they, do, when they make environmental declarations, they have a pre-screening and they um, choose to do uh, the lowest level review, which means no notification and no involvement of the public, a CADEX, if they have support from the community. And they're using you to do that. And I am assuming that you've accepted that responsibility, but I think you should double check this because it's incorrect that the FAA sort of does its own thing no, you are actually being used to approve these and you approve the GBAS overlays. Um, and it was on that basis that the rest of the people who are gonna be affected were pretty much ripped out of their rights to have a higher level assessment. So we got zero investment from the FAA, even though this is an SFO project, those procedures are published by the FAA. And therefore we don't have any post implementation, anything formal, no documentation. So you should first find out what your approval means. Thank you. Thank you. And with that chair, we do not have any more hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. Well, we come to the conclusion of this meeting and item number 11, which is the adjournment. And I would like to thank everyone for coming in, members, members of the public, 
ground table uh, and uh, the airport and the FAA and everybody else on the call. It really, we had a very robust discussion today on GVAS. I appreciate everybody's participation and looking forward to seeing you at the next meeting. And a, a word of encouragement one more time, attend the subcommittees. We could definitely use more members attending and participation. With that, good night, everyone. Thank you again. Sorry we went over a little bit. Good night. Good night.